Okay, hello everyone. So thank you for attending our Rutgers Efficient AI seminar. And this is our first talk in this summer series. And today we are very pleased to have the Amish Tactical from the Samba Nova Systems to give us the talk. And uh, Amish is a principal engineer at uh, Samba Nova System. Right now it's a very star. <laughs> A company in the AI chip. So before joining the Samba Nova, he worked with the ARM Research, AMD, PI, and Broadcom. His research has made a primarily focused on efficient execution of new networks on resource-constrained devices. Specifically, he has worked on model quantization, pruning, structured matrix, and low-rank decomposition. And he has published the many patents, papers, and contributes to various products across the multiple companies. And he completed his master in computer science from the Wisconsin Madison and a bachelor degree from the BITS in India. So now let's welcome Armish to give us the talk. Uh, thank you, Bo. And then thank you for providing me the opportunity to present at this uh, seminar series. So today I'll be talking, so while I work at Samanova Systems, today I'll be talking about my work that I did as a researcher at ARMS ML Research Lab. So my topic of presentation is pushing the limits of LSTM or RNN compression using chronicle products and doping. I'll be talking about uh, through a series of four or five different papers that I published across different conferences, conferences and workshop menus and for, provide a more overarching uh, uh, I get a narrative on what these papers were, why, why were we pursuing these projects, and what were some things that we learned. So before we start, let me sort of provide some context as to why were we pursuing this particular project at ARM. So the aim of my group at ARM was to develop new compression techniques to enable ML on a kilobyte budget. So to en ML, enable ML on sort of a very resource constrained device. What we realized is that to enable machine learning on a sort of a kilobyte budget, we really needed to push the limits of compression and get to compression factors of 15x, 20x, or beyond. This was especially true for networks that were LSTM or transformer based. Uh, these networks were generally used for time series data and natural language processing applications. These LSTM and transformer based networks used large fully connected layers, which made it hard for them to be deployed on resource constrained devices. So before sort of we get into the more details of, of the project and sort of the technical know-how, let's look at what happens when we start thinking in terms of large compression factors and how they really enable applications. So here you, on screen, you see three different applications that people want to operate in some form of always on uh, format. The first application is a keyword spotting application, which uh, at, at, at one point, the state of the art was around 240 kilobytes. Now, if you, come, if you sort of take this particular application at 240 kilobytes, you will be running this on a larger microcontroller, probably with a larger memory. That would imply that uh, it would be consuming more energy and then the battery life of your always on device would be small. If you compress this by compression factors of 20X or beyond, you bring the size of this application down to 15 kilobytes. And then with pruning, so it's quantization, you can bring it down to around four kilobytes as we'll show in the paper. At such low compression, at, at such low uh, memory usage, you can either run it on an extremely small microcontroller, or you can just bake in all of these parameters into an accelerator and run it in always on fashion. The human activity recognition application that we targeted was around 1.5 MB. And at 1.5 MB, it's very difficult to run it on a small microcontroller. But at around 20X compression, you're now looking at around 75 kilobytes or lesser in terms of size. And now you can run on a cheap microcontroller off the shelf. The chat application is actually quite big, it's around 25 MB. And at 25 MB, it's difficult for it to run uh, on say any microcontroller or even on a smartwatch device. But if you're able to compress it by 25X or beyond, you're now looking at an application that is less than one megabyte and can fit in your smartwatch caches initially easily or can run on a microcontroller in an always on fashion. So for a lot of key applications, large compression factors allows us to run on commodity hardware, which is cheap, in an always on fashion and sort of allowing us to do on device ML uh, more seamlessly. So the first thing that we sort of did was to take these applications and sort of compress them using traditional compression techniques. By traditional compression techniques, I, I mean things like pruning and low rank matrix factorization. Uh, 
I'm not talking about quantization because for the purpose of this work and, and it will show experimental evidence in the paper, I assume quantization is sort of orthogonal to all of these compression techniques. So when we compress these applications in including and lower magnitude factorization using large compression factors, we do see a significant loss in accuracy. For a simple application like MNIST, we're talking about two to three percent loss in accuracy. For the human activity recognition or HAR, we're talking about three to eight percent loss in accuracy. And for keyword spotting, again, you're talking about three to eight percent loss in accuracy. So effectively, we have rendered all of these applications quite useless in after compression. And it was within this context that we started looking beyond traditional way of doing compression uh, to figure out new techniques of doing uh, compression. That is when I sort of stumbled upon what, what is called a structured matrices. So before I tell you, talk about why structured matrices are good, let me walk through and uh, at least define what structured matrices are. So structured matrices are any matrices that can be expressed using fewer parameters than what would be required to express the larger matrix because these matrices are created using a fixed generative structure. So on the left-hand side is a circular matrix where each row is a, is a right shift of the previous row. Because each, the entire matrix is created by right shifting the previous row, the entire n cross n matrix can now be expressed using far fewer parameters. In fact, you can get, express the n cross n matrix using only n into one parameters. On the right hand side, you see the low rank matrix factorization, where a large matrix is a product of two smaller matrices, and the storage required for those two smaller matrices is lesser than the larger matrix. Specifically, the structured matrix that really caught my attention was Kronecker products. Kronecker products is a block based matrix multiplication algorithm where you create a larger matrix using two smaller matrices. If your smaller matrices is of size M cross N and P cross Q, the larger matrix is of size MP cross NQ. So you're multiplying the rows of A and the columns of B to get the larger matrix. So the way you do that is that you take each element in A, scale the matrix B and stick it into different quadrants of the larger matrix, right? And it, Effectively, you have created a larger matrix which should have required M and PQ number of parameters. But because you're generating this matrix using A and B, you are only requiring MN plus PQ number of parameters. If this seems a little fuzzy, let's just go over a simple, uh, a simple walkthrough of a simple example. And, and this would be the basis of all of the different, talk, uh, different slides that we talk about later on. So uh, hopefully this makes it easier for you to understand. So again, we are creating a larger matrix C using two smaller matrices A e and B. The way we do that is we take element one from A, scale matrix B and stick it in the top left quadrant. Take element two, scale matrix B and stick it in the top right quadrant. Similarly, bottom left and bottom right quadrant. So effectively, you have created a larger matrix C, which should have ideally required 16 parameters using two smaller matrices A and B, which now require eight parameters. And and this amount of sort of here, you're getting to X compression, but the amount of compression increases as the size of the matrix increases. Now let's sort of start, start talking about why Kronecker products or our structured matrices are, are more interesting in terms of compression. Firstly, because of the generative property, you are able to create a larger matrix using smaller matrices, and you can really have achieved large compression factors. Say if your matrix C is of size 256 cross 256, you can create matrix C using two matrices A and B of size 16 cross 16 each, right? And effectively, by creating matrix C using only A and B, you only require five and two parameters, 256 from A and 256 from B. And uh, instead of what was initially required to be 256 cross 256, this creates a, a sort of a compressed format where the matrix is compressed by a factor of 128x. So you can achieve large compression factors using Kronecker products and as the matrices get bigger and bigger, the compression factors also increases. But achieving large compression factors is not the only reason why Kronecker products are interesting. The other key element about Kronecker products is the rank preservation property. Now, in case of Kronecker product, the rank of the larger matrix C is the product of the rank of the two smaller matrices. Now, for people who are not from linear algebra background, the, the rank of a matrix is a measure of its expressibility. The more the rank of a matrix, the more expressible a matrix is, the larger the solution space is can, it can span. And basically, if you can span a larger solution space, uh, you have a probability of getting a higher accuracy. 
And when, in one of our previous works, we show that the rank of especially LSTM matrix is has a direct correlation to the accuracy that you get. More the rank of a matrix, the more core, more accuracy that you'll get in an LSTM and transformer based network. So chronicle products are able to get large compression factors while achieving almost full rank sometimes. So that sort of allowed them to be very interesting in terms of compression capabilities. Now, now, now pruning can also preserve the rank of a matrix after large compression factors. But what we observed in our work and through series of experiment is that pruning creates a lot of unstable matrices at large compression factors, because at large compression factors of say 20X or beyond, we're talking about 95% or more a sparse matrix. And as you keep adding more and more zeros, the matrix structures become unstable and the eigenvalues of these matrices become quite large. And as the eigenvalues of the matrix become quite large, the LSTM uh, activation starts saturating because your input activations are uh, sort of expanded or are amplified significantly. But in case of Kronecker product, this compression happens without introducing zero elements into the matrix and, and all of these good properties around eigenvalues of the matrices are preserved. So that made Kronecker products really interesting in terms of compression. And we started thinking about how we should compress uh, neural networks using Kronecker products. Now, when we started doing that, we ran into a lot of methodology issue. It was unclear of what is the best method uh, to compress neural networks using Kronecker products. The first methodology issue is that how do we decompose a matrix C into, in, how do you decide the number of Kronecker factors to be, uh, to decompose a matrix C into? So if your matrix C is expressed as a Kronecker product of two matrices, A1 and A2, then C has two Kronecker factors. Similarly, a, a matrix C can have N number of Kronecker factors. In fact, uh, the, the value of N would be log of the value of row or the column of, of the uh, matrix C. So you have a lot of choices here and it's unclear how, how do you decide how, which particular number of Kronecker factors or how many number of Kronecker factors you choose for C. Now, one of the observations is that as you increase the number of Kronecker factors, the amount of compression increases. So your intuition would be just do the maximum number of Kronecker factors for a matrix C. However, we show that in our work, as the number of Kronecker factor increases, you Kronecker product neural networks run into vanishing gradient issues. And there is both theoretical evidence for that we prove using theory and also provide experimental evidence for that. So ideally you want to increase the number of Kronecker factors, but you pay the price of accuracy in, because you learn into vanishing gradient issues. Now, the second problem is we also need to think about inference. We want these applications to run in an always on fashion. So we really want them to run in a more responsive manner. So the question you need to ask ourselves is that how we do how do we do inference? In case of LSTMs, inference is generally a matrix vector product calculation. Now your matrix C here is a chronicle product of two smaller matrices. So to do an inference, one way would be to expand this two matrices into a larger matrix C and then do the matrix vector product calculation. But by expanding, you're paying a significant cost, right? And you'll be, you'll be significantly slower than the baseline. By expanding, you're also sort of losing the benefit of, of compression because now while your storage cap uh, capacity is lower, after expanding, your neural network is still bloated up. And for a lot of these microcontrollers, cache space is significantly uh, sort of hard to get and uh, sort of it's expensive. So bloating your entire neural network to its full size is not recommended. So the question becomes, how do we do inference? <clears throat> Turns out if the number of Kronecker factors is restricted to two, you can use simple tricks from linear algebra to do inference without actually converting this into the full blown matrix. Your inference in fact turns into two small gem operations into instead of a Kronecker product plus a matrix vector operation. So effectively using one solution, we find uh, using one uh, method, we find solutions to two problems. First, by restricting Kronecker factors to two, you solve the vanishing gradient issue. And second, you also sort of solve your runtime issue, right? And, and once you do that, you can see you can get significant compression factors while getting a lot of ops reduction, which can translate into speed up because you're doing gem operations. And most commodity hardware are very good at doing gem operations using off the shelf library. Even when you solve this issue, there's other problems also. So we talked about a matrix C of size 256 cross 256 being represented by two smaller matrices, each of size 16 cross 16. But that's not the only way to represent, represent a matrix C. A matrix C can be represented as a chronic product of two smaller matrices, one of size 2 cross 128 and the other of size 128 cross 2. 
So the question becomes, what is the better way of doing compression? Should we go the left-hand side route or the right-hand side route? And that's where things become interesting. And, and the, the insight here is that always try to equally divide the dimensions of C across these quantum matrices, because when you do that, you get maximum compression with maximum rack. And again, in the paper, we talk about uh, why this happens. So this is sort of reinforcing what we talked about earlier, the same matrix C decomposed using two Kronecker factors, each of different dimensions. And if you equally divide the dimensions of C across A and B, you get maximum compression, compression in both cases 128x, but you also get maximum rank after compression. In one case, the rank is four. In the other case, the rank of the matrix C after compression is still full rank, that is 256. So effectively, you're getting full rank at maximum compression. Now, there are a lot of nuances in respect to sort of compressing a neural network using Kronecker products. And I don't sort of, I sort of walk over all of them and sort of just present you some of the key insight, but I do highly encourage you to read this paper to sort of understand how do you sort of uh, train using a neural network using Kronecker products. Up until now, I've talked about Kronecker products and some of the good properties. I haven't really shown you that it is actually better than traditional way of doing that. So let's take a sort of a step back and focus on that for the next few slides. In our paper, we sort of compress a lot of different applications using Kronecker products. Here, I'll talk about the results of four different applications. But what you have seen is for large compression factors, the results in this in these slides are universally applicable for a lot of different IoT workloads. The way we do compression for a Kronecker product network is that we, we instantiate the network such that all the matrices are represented as Kronecker product of two smaller matrices. And we initialize these smaller matrices using uniform distribution or any uh, Xavier or Hay distribution that you might choose. And we allow neural network to figure out what the values of these two smaller matrices should be. By baking in the compression during training or be doing training aware compression or comp sorry, compression aware training, we are able to find a good solution space. We, I'll be talking about results of four applications here, uh, ranging from keyword spotting, human activity recognition to image recognition. And the size of these applications are from few thousand parameters to around Half a billion, half a million parameter of parameters. For a comparison point of view, we compare Kronecker product compression with pruning and low rank matrix factorization. These are more traditional way of doing compression. Pruning is adding sparsity, low rank matrix factorization is decomposing a matrix into two smaller matrices. We also train a smaller baseline when compared to the larger baseline. So the smaller number of baseline has the same number of parameter as the compressed network. By training a smaller baseline, we are sort of showing that the original baseline network is not over-parameterized. If the original baseline network and the small baseline network with fewer parameters lead to the same accuracy, you're sort of indicating that the baseline is actually not good and also over-parameterized. But if they are leading to different accuracies and if a compression network is able to get better accuracy than the smaller baseline, you are effectively saying is that your compression technique is able to do better uh, in, in terms of compressing the neural network than the smaller baseline. So here you see the results of compression for two applications, MNIST and human activity recognition. What you see is that at large compression factors, uh, Kronecker product compression is beating uh, traditional compression techniques by two to 3% on MNIST and almost two to 8% on human activity recognition. In fact, we are getting almost, uh, we are within the 1.2% baseline, 1.2% uh, accuracy of the baseline at large compression factors of 18X and 30X. Not only that, we took these compressed networks and ran it on a Raspberry Pi, for, Pi board using Eigen library and sort of measured the inference runtime. And what we see is that our inference runtime is actually faster than the baseline. So uh, in, in case of you in, in, in sorry, in case of HAR, our inference runtime is 470 milliseconds before compression and after KP compression is around 157 milliseconds. Now, if you look at the keyword spotting and USPS application, the story remains similar. At large compression factors, Kronecker product compression beats traditional compression techniques uh, by a large margin from two to 8%. And again, we are faster than the baseline techniques for both these applications. In fact, for USPS network, we are within 0.5% of the original network, 0.5% accuracy of the baseline network. So hopefully by now, we are sort of convinced that Kronecker product compression works. It can give you better accuracy than traditional compression techniques. 
And then specifically, it especially works for these IoT workloads that we talked about previously. The next obvious question for us to ask was that, can we scale these chronicle product techniques to these large, to these larger and larger workloads? Especially you are really interested in large NLP applications. This is because we, we thought that uh, conversational AI and human computer interaction are the next wave of applications that is going to drive, uh, drive uh, the, the sale of hardware on the edge devices. And then if you look at these conversational AI applications, these NLP applications get quite big. They get really huge and are not deployable on current edge devices. So developing a technique that can really compress them a large compression factor would be really useful. So we went ahead and tried chronicle product compression on these large NLP applications. And what we saw is that we are able to compress these applications by a large compression factor. Uh, but when we compress them, these large compression factors, we are also losing significantly in terms of accuracy. So chronicle products worked for IoT workloads, but did not work for large NLP application. And this was slightly confusing to us. The rank property, the, uh, the ability to sort of compress matrix without losing rank and without interesting zeros does not change between IoT to NLP applications. And yet it worked for one set of applications and not for the other. And that's when we started investigating a little further. We started thinking about why, what it was working for IoT workloads, what was unique about them and why it stopped working for large NLP workloads and how do we fix them? <clears throat> so let's sort of go through the same journey that we went through when we were investigating this problem for the large NLP applications. Actually, this might be a good time to pause and see if there are questions. Um, and sort of because you're sort of running into the next phase of the talk. And then if there are no more questions, I can sort of start moving there. So are there any particular questions around the first set of uh, slides on Chronicle products? Yes, so actually I have some questions, but I will wait till the end of your talk yeah, and I can ask. Sure, you. yeah, yeah. Maybe, okay. maybe some you. of my questions will be addressed in your later talks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, sure, all right, okay, thank you. All right, so <clears throat> to understand what is sort of hampering the, the, the accuracy of chronicle product compressed network for large NLP applications, let's take a step back and again, look at this generative way of how chronicle product is, is producing a larger matrix using smaller set of matrices. So we, we looked at this example before, where C was produced using A chronicle B, where you take one element from A scale B, create the top left quadrant, similarly you create the top right quadrant, bottom left and bottom right quadrant, right? And this generative way or the fixed structure of, of how you create the large matrix C allows you to compress the matrix, right? Without using, allows you to compress the matrix using large compression factors. <clears throat> now, this, this generative or fixed structure that allows you to achieve large compression factors also can hamper uh, some, also can hamper uh, accuracy for the model. So to understand that, let's look at this particular example. <clears throat> now, suppose during back propagation, your back propagation uh, algorithm, say your favorite back propagation algorithm optimizer, say, SGD or Adam determines that this value needs to go from two to four to get to the minima that gives you the best accuracy for that application, right? Now in an ideal matrix, changing this value from two to four, it's going to be easy. But now for our, our scenario, matrix C does not exist, right? Matrix C is expressed as a chronicle product of A and B, right? So to change this value from two to four in matrix C, you need to go back to A and B to make the necessary changes. Now this value two was created by multiplying this two with this value one. So you can either change this value or change this value to get to, ch to change this value from two to four. Now suppose if you change this value from two to four, then this value goes from two to four, but all these other values also change because these four values are created by multiplying two with the matrix B, right? If you change this value from one to two, again, this value, this value also changes, but all these four values also change uh, from, uh, or all these values, two value, all these four values also double from their original values. So effectively to change one value in, G, in, in C, you need to change multiple values in the larger matrix. 
So the fixed structure that allows us allowed us to sort of compress the neural network also led to a lot of chaos, right? You wanted to change one value, you end up changing more than one value. So instead of getting the minima that you want, you keep dancing around that particular minima. Now this issue is prevalent for all workloads that we have explored, IoT and NLP workloads. But what happens is that as the as the uh, workloads get bigger and bigger, the size of the matrices C also get bigger and bigger. And when that happens, each location in A or B influences a lot more locations in the larger neural network. For the IoT workloads, the matrices C were of size 256 cross 256 or 512 cross 512. So each location in A had influenced only around 256 different locations in C. But for these larger NLP workloads, uh, the matrices were of size 1600 cross 1600 or 2500 cross 2500. So each location in A and B influenced 1600 to 2500 different locations in the larger matrix C. So this pro problem got exaggerated when we moved towards NLP workloads. And that is why we were not never able to get to the minima that we want, and the accuracy that we want for the larger uh, neural networks. So the obvious question that we asked of ourselves is that how do we fix that problem? So if you take a step back, what is the problem? The problem is that there are certain parameters in the matrix C that wanted additional degrees of freedom and the fixed structure of the chronicle product matrix did not allow them to have those additional degrees of freedom. So the way we solve this problem is we thought we will add an extremely sparse matrix on top of the chronicle product matrix. And in this extremely sparse matrix, the non-zero locations would correspond to locations in the chronicle product matrix, which required those additional degrees of freedom. In our cartoon example, <clears throat> this value in the chronicle product matrix wanted to go from two to four and required that additional degrees of freedom. We, were, we weren't able to take this value from two to four because the way you change this value from two to four or it was for us to go to, to A and B and sort of change different other values in C. So what we do is that we create a sparse matrix where only this location is non-zero and everything else is zero. And when you add these two matrices together, you get to the minima that you want. So now effectively your weight matrix is a sum of two different matrices. One is a chronic compressed matrix and one is an extremely sparse matrix. And if you ensure that the sparse matrix remains at a large sparsity value of 95% or 99%, you would see that you are still able to get good compression factors of 20x or beyond. And this new compression technique is what we call as dope chronic product. This, this idea of adding a sparse matrix on top of an existing matrix is called doping. And when that sparse matrix is chronic product, when this structure on which you talk, on top of which you add the sparse matrix is chronic developed using chronic products, we call the, the resulting compression technique as dope chronic product. The, the reference to doping is mostly sort of a hat tip to how, how things are done in semiconductor industry to create all the electronics device around you. So the next obvious question is, how do we identify locations in the chronic product matrices that require these additional degrees of freedom? And that's the sort of sort of leaning on back propagation to do, do the work for us. So the, the way we do that is that initially we replace a weight matrix W as a chronic product of two smaller matrices and an extremely dense matrix or a completely dense matrix. Now, over time, we sort of anneal the sparsity of this dense matrix from 0% to the required amount of sparsity. And we use a pruning criterion, which in this case is magnitude to determine what values are important and what values are unimportant. The hope is that the values that are retained after pruning are the values uh, are the values that correspond to parameters in the chronic product space that require additional degrees of freedom. And the values that are removed are, are, are correspond to parameters that don't require that additional degrees of freedom. So we start off with a dense matrix and prune it to the sparsity level over time to the required amount of sparsity, which would be around 98%, 99%. And we'll, keep, we'll learn both these matrices simultaneously. So at, at this point, we thought we had a way to sort of fixed chronic product compression for large NLP application. And we are excited to train large language models with large compression factors using dope common chronic product compression techniques. So we took a large language model, which had a baseline perplexity of 82. This had around four LSTM layers, each of size 2600 cross 1300. The effective size of language models that we looked at were around 25 MB to 50 MB. Now for language model accuracy is well measured in perplexity. And in case of perplexity, the lower value is better. 
So keep that in mind as you look at the results section in the next slide. So we were really excited. We started compressing these large language models using doping products, but we, what we observed was something very interesting. So without doping, when you are doing vanilla chronic product compression, we get a compression factor of 338x. At 338 compression factor, we get a, a sort of a perplexity value of 104. Now our baseline perplexity was 82. Uh, our compression after chronic product compression was 104. So we are worse than 82, right? Now, when we add 1% more parameter on top of the chronic product matrix, that is we, are, we dope by 1% uh, more parameters, uh, we observe something interesting. Because we are adding 1% more parameter, the compression factor reduces. Our compression factors goes from 338x to 100x. Now, intuitively, if you add more parameters into a network, your accuracy should improve. But what we observed is that our accuracy actually got significantly worse. In fact, our accuracy reduced to a value of 130, 138. So adding more parameters to the network actually made the accuracy worse. And that was confusing, right? We wanted doping or the sparse additive matrix to support our chronic product matrices. But what was happening is that our intuitions were not working and our accuracy got worse. Worse. So at this point, we started investigating the problem. And to investigate the problem, we started looking at the loss curves. So when we plot the loss curves, we observed something interesting. So here you are seeing the loss curves that we are plotting on the y-axis on the left-hand side, training perplexity as the training progresses. And on the right-hand side of the y-axis is the perplex or, or the sparsity of this dense matrix um, as the training progresses. And what we see here is that during the initial phase of training, when, when this dense matrix is not, is, is still has around 30, has, has only around 30 to 40% sparsity, the training curves look good. The training loss is decreasing as the training is progressing. But when we require to, when we reach due to the this large amount of sparsity that we wanted, the training accuracy curves very weird. The training loss increases significantly and then driver recovers back. Effectively, the minima that you had learned was to rely on the sparse matrix. And once you sort of pruned away most of this parameter of the sparse matrix, you lost that minima and never recovered back. Now, this was opposite to what we wanted. We wanted the sparse matrix to be playing a supporting act in this narrative. Instead of playing a supporting act of just supporting some parameters in the chronic product space, it started playing, it started sort of uh, becoming the main act of this narrative. Most of the accuracy was coming from this dense matrix. And when it was pruned away, we never recovered back. So effectively, these chronic product matrices were not doing their job. So the obvious next question is that, that we asked ourselves was, why was this happening? And at this time, we took a step back and realized this actually made sense. So this phenomena where the chronic product matrix becomes too reliant on this dense matrix, and when this dense matrix is pruned away to the required amount of sparsity, it never recovers back, is called co-matrix adaptation in our paper. So the question sort of, we asked ourselves, why is co-matrix adaptation happening? And sort of, how do we fix that? So uh, first let's get to why this is happening. So if you look at it, it actually made sense. The way we train our neural network is that we express a matrix M as a chronic product of two smaller matrices and a dense matrix. And then this dense matrix is eventually pruned away to the required amount of sparsity. Now, if you think about it, in the initial phases of training, the chronic product matrices only have 10K parameters, right? These are really, really compressible, right? This dense matrix, this is sparse matrix starts off dense or 0% sparse or 100% dense, however you want to sort of uh, look at it. At that point, for the applications that we talked about previously, this dense matrix has around 4 million parameters. So it has almost around 20,000 X more parameters than the chronic product matrices. So during the initial phase of training, this dense matrix gets 20,000 more X more graded updates than the chronic product matrices. So obviously your minima that you learn would be too reliant on these dense matrices. And when you prune away this sort of ratio becomes smaller and your sparse matrix has two X more parameters than chronic product matrices. And you're talking about a more equal footing. But by the time you prune this to the required amount of sparsity, the damage is already done. During the initial phase of training, the minima that you navigate to is more focused on the dense matrix. So the question becomes, how do you manage co-matrix adaptation? And the obvious answer becomes is that you reduce the reliance on the dense matrix during the initial phase of training. And you can borrow a lot from traditional machine learning 
uh, tools and techniques to reduce this reliance on the dense matrix. Specifically, we looked at regularization and block coordinate descent. In case of block coordinate descent, what we do is that we, we ensure that the Kronecker product matrices get more gradient updates than the dense matrix in the initial phase, phase of the training. And using regularization, what we ensure is that the, 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 uh, the, in, the, the contribution of the dense matrix is significantly lower by putting this regularization term in front of the dense matrix during the initial part of the training. By using these two techniques, what we are sort of telling our training algorithm is to ensure that most of the accuracy should come from the Kronecker product matrices. Now look at, let's look at what happens when we do that. When we do that, what we see is that this bump in accuracy, in bump or in, in training accuracy or sort of the, the, the fact that the training accuracy was getting worse as sparsity was increasing is, is no longer, is significantly managed, right? This, the blue curve was the initial curve that we have during training, where at around 99% sparsity, we are significantly worse than from where we wanted to be and never recover back. Using these regularization techniques and block coordinate descent, we are somewhere here where the bump in perplexity is better than what we had previously. This better training dynamics also translates into better sort of a perplexity scores of the end application. The baseline perplexity was 82. At 338x compression, we are talking about a, base, a perplexity of 104. Without managing this co-matrix adaptation, our perplexity score was 138. Again, with perplexity lower is better. So 138 is worse than 104. After managing the perplexity, after managing this co-matrix adaptation, our perplexity score is around 100, which is better than what we had for 338x. However, the bump still exists. It's not completely gone away. So the next question that we ask ourselves is that, could we do better? Is there a way to further manage this pump? And if we further manage this pump, will this perplexity score go even lower at 100x compression technique? And the answer to that question was yes. And to manage this sort of bump further, we actually invented a new form of regularization called co-matrix row regularization. I, I don't go into the details of co-matrix row regularization, but the math behind and math and intuition behind co-matrix row regularization is in the a paper around chronic product compression using doping. Uh, but at an intuitive level, what sort of that means is what we are doing is that we are effectively using dropout at a different granularity. We are using dropout at a row granularity where we ensure that sometimes a row exists from the chronic product matrix or sometimes the row exists from the, uh, the dense matrix and sometimes they don't exist at all. And by sort of Managing the probability values of these Bernoulli distributions, you can ensure that more gradients flows to the uh, chronic product matrix than the dense matrix. But when we sort of train these neural networks using CMR, we see the accuracy curves are even more better. So this is where we were with respect to using block coordinate descent. If you use CMR, this is where we are. So we have managed this issue of a perplexity bump even more. And that translates into sort of uh, uh, a perplexity score also. Now we are at 100x comp compression, we are at 95 perplexity score, where earlier we were at around 100 perplexity score. So at this point, we thought we had the a good training receipt to compress these large NLP applications using large compression factors uh, using chronic products. And we thought about compressing a wide variety of NLP applications and comparing them with traditional compression techniques and also previous state of the art. So let's look at some of the results that we collected. So this is a more, I, I would say, holistic view of the same NLP application that we looked previously. Here we are again plotting the perplexity score across different compression factors. And we are looking at, uh, because we are looking at a perplexity score versus compression factor, and in case of perplexity, perplexity score, the lower value is better. Compression techniques that exist in the bottom right corner are, are going to be actually better, right? So our baseline is at 1x compression at around 82 perplexity score. And what we see is that all previous compression techniques, both previous state of the art and traditional compression techniques like pruning and low rank matrix factorization, are nowhere near dope chronic product at 25x compression. In fact, at 25x compression, dope chronic product is able to achieve almost the same accuracy as baseline. You are getting around 2.5x better compression than previous state of the art and almost getting 15% better perplexity score than pruning. 
we applied the same compression techniques to other NLP application and even bigger, and I would say better uh, language models and to applications beyond language models like translation and to certain other uh, natural language understanding applications. But our observations does not change. Uh, Dope Kronikar product is able to beat previous state of the art by a factor of 2.5x or 2x or 1.5x while achieving similar perplexity score or accuracy score depending on the application. So you're achieving the same score as the uh, previous state of the art while getting more, uh, while getting 1.5x or 2.5x more compression. Not only that, we took these dope chronicle product networks, we implemented them on a Raspberry Pi board using your off the shelf icon library, and we measured the inference runtime of these compressed networks. And what we saw is that the speed up on the commodity hardware is also significant. For these large compression factors, we are looking at 3x to 5x speed up than the baseline network. So you are getting large compression factors with almost all of the baseline, I would say with, within 1% margin of the baseline accuracy with significant speed up on commodity hardware. So you're hitting the trifecta of our goods, right? The next obvious question that we asked ourselves is that we started focusing only on the doping aspect of, of this particular phenomena. So we, we looked at dope chronic product, but we wanted to ask ourselves, is doping a universally accepted or universally useful tool for compression or, or is does that only work for chronic products? And what we realized is that doping actually works for all other structures beyond chronic products. And in, in, in this case, that structure is more loosely defined. We in fact sort of compressed a network, network using two-bit quantization where each of the weight values uh, and, and the activations are two-bit values. And we doped on top of that particular network using uh, FP16 values. And again, with only 1% doping, we are able to boost the accuracy of, of these uh, quantized networks by a large margin and beat st previous state of the art. We took a lower matrix factorized network and then compressed using a large compression factor where we saw a large accuracy loss. But when we replaced this compression technique by doped LMF, where we replace the weight matrix as a product of lower rank matrix factorized network plus sort of uh, a doped net of uh, plus a sparse matrix, we are again able to boost the accuracy significantly. So doping was something that was just not applicable to chronic products, but was applicable to other structures like sub-byte quantization and lower rank matrix factorization also. Again, for the purpose of brevity, I sort of skip some of this, uh, these things, but in the paper, we talk about all of these things. We show you more results. We talk about how doping ben benefits sub, sub byte quantization and other structures. We talk a bit, we go into a lot more mathematics of why doping works, how co matrix row regularization works, and then sort of how do you train or what are the training receipts to, to sort of train using these techniques. And importantly, we'll also sort of talk about some of the limitations of, of this work. And then what is making it difficult for us to scale this particular compression technique to larger and larger benchmarks. But uh, at this point, I would like to conclude my talk. Hopefully you enjoyed it and hopefully learned something out of this talk. Uh, my hope is that you took sort of, you took some of these key points from this talk, specifically you learned about two new ways of doing compression, chronicle products and dope chronicle products. You learn that using these new compression tools, you are able to push the limits of compression to large compression factors. Uh, you, you sort of saw that you can actually get the benefits of this compression techniques on existing hardware, using existing off the shelf libraries on commodity hardware. So you don't have to create new instruction sets. You don't have to create new hardware. Uh, while not covered in this paper, but we sort of go more in the, not, not covered in this presentation, but we go, over this a little bit more in the, in the different papers that we have published, we show that you can further compress, sort of combine these compression techniques, chronic product and do chronic product with quantization, uh, say 16 bit quantization or eight bit quantization to get even more compression out of your network. So that's all I had for today. Uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to take more questions around this work. Thank you, thank you, Amish. So, a very great talk. So, any questions from the audience? Armish, uh, uh, this is Predra. Uh, uh, can I ask a question about? Uh, do you have an idea of where, um, you know, what type of problems 
uh, do you think chronic or product is better suitable for than for others? Yeah, so for me, in my experience, this is really good for LSTM based networks and, and to a certain extent transformer networks. So the reason is that, uh, and then it's just not my work, but some other works have also shown that LSTM networks are very sensitive to compression techniques. Uh, two things, uh, they are very unstable. So as you compress more, uh, the, this unstability increases. And that's where traditional compression techniques don't work for LSTM networks. Uh, and then th that is where sort of chronic products become useful. They are able to create stable LSTM networks and large compression factors. Does that but, answer your question? Well, but, but you, I mean, just thinking about it, like chronic product introduces structure, right? And some yes. problems may have structures, others don't have structures. I mean, that's a... Yeah, 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 yeah. So yes, your structure would be uh, yeah, I, I guess you, you raise a good point, right? You are introducing a structure and some certain data sets or certain problems are going to be more sort of uh, responsive to that particular structure and certain data sets are not going to be. In the work that we did, surprisingly, we didn't come, come across uh, any sort of, if, I, I guess we never saw catastrophic loss in accuracy for IoT workloads using chronic product compression. That sort of implied that for the data sets that we looked at, the, this particular structure or the bias that we introduce or the prior that we introduce, whatever you want to call it, works for these particular data sets. But I, I do agree, there can be data sets where this particular structure does not work. And I haven't done work as to figure out, to, to sort of figure out if there is a way to determine whether uh, we can a priori know what structure, what data sets are going to be amenable to these structures and what data sets are not going to be do that. Uh, unfortunately, the way we have done it is just to take networks, compress them using chronic products and see what happens. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? So I have a question. So um, thank you for your sharing. You mentioned a lot. Um, uh, on the NLP related, all of this is about like recurrent neural network. So I was wondering uh, how it works, how it perform on uh, convolutional layer uh, tasks. Right, so we tried applying chronic product to convolution networks and it, it really didn't work out. So the technique we call, call which we call doping, doping generally worked for convolution layers also, right? This dope quantized network worked really well for convolution neural networks. So you, you take your favorite convolution neural network, quantize it using two to subbyte levels and then dope on top of it. And then you'll get an accuracy boost. Uh, but Kronecker product as such, yeah, it did not really work out for convolution neural networks. Hmm. But it would work, it, it did work out for LSTMs and transformer based networks both. Thank you. Yes, so I just want to follow uh, one Zhao's question. So, so have you ever tried to apply the, the, your approach to the transformer as well? Yes, so, uh, okay, so yeah, I, I did. So for smaller transformer networks, it, it does work. We tried to scale it to BERT. And at that point, we sort of started running into the limitations with this particular network. So the limitations is not more from a compressibility capability. The limitations is more from an issue with that is that because initially, so, okay, let, let me just take a step back, right? So for large NLP networks, what we learned is that chronic product in itself doesn't work. You need to really do dope chronic product to make it work and compress large NLP applications without significant loss in accuracy. Now the way dope chronic product works is that you start off with a matrix which is sum of a chronic product matrix and a dense matrix, and then eventually prune this dense matrix to the required amount of sparsity, right? So effectively what you have done is that you have doubled the amount of memory required to sort of train a network, right? So each new matrix that you add for an atom optimizer, you're adding three X more amount of memory for each new. So if you add 10 parameters, you require three X more parameters, or you add 30 more parameters during the training regime. So as we started scaling this to larger and larger, transformer-based models, what we realized is that our training time became extremely slow. In fact, we were 3x to 4x slower 
than the baseline. So scaling our sort of, I would say, experiments to BERT and larger networks was becoming difficult. And that's very sort of run into the limitation of, of how doping is currently being done. In the paper, we also talk about how we can fix those issues, but we never got around fixing those issues and trying a different way of doing uh, doping. But for smaller or medium-sized transformer networks, smaller than BERT, uh, we did see the same benefits that we had we have seen earlier in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. So other questions from the audience? I have a qu another question. Uh, have you um, computed the uh, flops reduction uh, instead of the parameter compression? Yeah, yeah. So you can see that here. So okay, for dope chronicle product, you can see it's speed up on commodity hardware, right? So we are implementing these compressed networks using Eigen library on a Raspberry Pi 4 board. So here you have the MAC reduction and you have here you have the speed up on commodity hardware. In general, what we have seen is that the MAC reduction does not uh, translate into equivalent sort of, I would say, uh, uh, speed up. So here you're talking about 7x MAC reduction, but here you're talking about only 4x speed up and sort of similar observations is here 6x to 2x. And then part of the reason here is that with, with I guess the way you sort of, um, break down the computation is the, in case of Eigen library, uh, kernel launch latency was significant for Raspberry Pi 4 board, so it was just not well optimized. And in case of uh, chronicle products or dope chronicle products you're doing inference, you are doing lesser compute, but you are doing more kernel launches. Each kernel is significantly smaller. If you look at, if you remember that gem, double gem call that we talked about previously. And because that kernel launch latency is la large for Eigen library, uh, it eats up into your Mac reduction and you don't get equivalent speed up as you get MAC reduction. But we do think this is easy to sort of fix if you are using a more, a better gem library than Eigen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It, it just to follow the Miao's question. So here you actually measure the, your model based on using the Eigen library. So have I ever done that just to use like the, the TensorFlow light? Uh, yeah, so I haven't done that. Uh, at least when I was doing this work, sparsity support in TensorFlow light didn't exist. And, and it, it from a tooling point of view, it was just difficult to uh, deploy a TensorFlow light model on Raspberry Pi forward. I know things have come along quite far, quite far away for, for TensorFlow light, but we haven't redone this experiments uh, using the new set of tools that we have available. Okay, okay, thank you. So, other questions from the audience? Um, I have another question. So, um, I, I noticed that you um, actually uh, add a unstructured matrix to the uh, original, uh, uh, I mean, after the chronicler product. Yes. So this is a unstructured uh, matrix. So right. um, how does it uh, speed up in the actual implementation? So. Right, right. So, so yeah, yes, you, you are adding an unstructured sparse matrix on top of a chronicle product matrix. But, but the thing with unstructured sparse matrix is that it's not always bad, right? Uh, here we are talking about 99% sparse matrix, right? So, or 1% dense, however you want to do it. For sparse matrices using CSR format, uh, if you are going above 80 or 85% sparsity values, you do get significant speed up. And at 95% sparsity, you get a large amount of speed up using CSR values, using CSR format. So yes, in general, unstructured matrices can be bad, but it, there's a range. It's, it's bad only if you are doing sparsity, say less than 70% or 75%. If you go beyond 75, 80% sparsity, you do get, you, you hit that knee in terms of when you're measuring speed up over baseline and you start seeing significant benefit of, of uh, using unstructured sparse matrices. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah that, that is also a question I would like to ask. So. So have you ever considered that is to further to 
make this an unstructured sparse the doped matrix become more structured and then can provide further speed up. Right, maybe, but I, I don't think intuitively it would work, right? So if I, if I come to think about, if you sort of take a step back and see why we are doing this, right? We are already introducing, introducing a very fixed structure uh, using Kronecker products, right? And we wanted some parameters to have additional degrees of freedom. Uh, when we are adding those parameters, when we sort of select those parameters that need additional degrees of freedom in this sparse matrix and add more structure to it, yeah, I I guess my intuitions tell me it might not work, but in all honesty, we haven't run that experiment yet. Also at around 99% sparsity, at least from what I remember, when you're talking about 99% sparsity, structured and unstructured uh, sparsity, the benefits that the gap between them is, is not that much, right? Unstructured capacity also provides you significant speed up at that particular level. Maybe I'm wrong, but at least it's been a while since I've done those experiments. But I, I do re remember that between unstructured and structured sparsity, the gap is significant initially, but as sparsity increases, the gap reduces significantly. Thank you. So, audience, do you have some other questions? So, so, so actually I have another question that's a more general question. So yeah. your doping method is very interesting. And actually, so in the spring series, we also have another speaker from the UC Berkeley. Amir, um, yeah, he also mentioned that, so to, to combine the low rank decomposition plus the sparsity together, I think it's also kind of the doping. So, so, so I was wondering, so in your vision, so how do you think about the doping and um, how about it's the, it's a suitable scope and it's capability limitations and, um, and right. so, so right. any like theoretical analysis or to, for this general strategy? Right, so uh, I guess uh, from a theoretical point of view, um, I, I think it makes sense because I, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, but a lot of this is sort of inspired from classical machine learning literature, where you had something called as robust PCA or robust principal component analysis. And robust principal component analysis does the same thing. You, you take a matrix, you do principal component analysis to figure out your best sort of accesses that sort of determine the most amount of your data. You compress it using principal component analysis and then add a sparse matrix on top of it to sort of capture some of these outliers that are required. So there is a theoretical foundation, I would say, in this particular uh, compression technique. As from a usage point of view, where sort of do I see this becoming useful? Personally, the more I think about it, the more I believe this will be more useful in this extreme notion of compression where people really want to sort of deploy this on a resource constraint device, like on a kilobyte budget, right? Where every amount of compression that you sort of squeeze out is going to be useful, right? And allows you to run a more complex model. The, the problem is it's unclear how do you combine, how do you sort of set this problem up in, in this, I would say in the last two, three years, a lot of compression has moved towards neural architecture search, right? Compression is sort of very difficult, requires a lot of hand parameter, hand tuning, hyperparameters, and you need to sort of, uh, sort of bring in sort of a lot of uh, experience compressing large, language, large models in general. And neural architecture search, sort of takes away all of those expertise and turns all of that expertise into more of a compute problem, right? So that makes it easier for people to adopt uh, compression techniques because all you have to do is just launch a neural architecture search for a particular model and, and you get your compressed model for the parameters that you set. Your parameters would be amount of compression, speed up, whatever. So given this entire drive about moving towards neural architecture search, how do you sort of, reconcile and add doping into that neural architecture search is, is a more difficult problem because in neural architecture search, the more things that you add to your search space, the difficult the problem becomes. And that is sort of unexplored and also unclear. And that sort of makes it difficult to sort of understand uh, how this idea of combining different compression techniques is going to take 
off, right? So that's one problem. The second problem, as I said, how you do doping is going to be a serious question. The way I do doping is, is sort of has the severe limitation that increases the capacity of the model or increases the amount of memory that you require to train the model significantly. And, and as you scale to larger and larger applications, this becomes a very huge pain point. BERT takes a lot of time to train, right? Even on eight V100, it takes seven days to train. If I sort of increase the training time by three X by four to four X, you're not like looking at one month to train BERT, which, is, which isn't very productive or, or useful. So you need to find a more different way of doing doping, right? Uh, I guess UC Berkeley has lot, worked a lot in terms of these uh, Haitian product, Haitian vector product approximations or sort of second order approximations during optimization, which you can use to do doping. And maybe that makes it better. But again, incorporating those Haitian product approximations into neural architecture search is also more difficult. So there are these practical limitations that I would say that make it hard to understand how it's going to evolve or are sort of hard to imagine how it's going to evolve, if that makes sense. Because I, I do believe personally, machine learning research and adoption is a lot, a lot about tooling and open source also, and not just about ideas, right? In, this, in, the, in the current scenario, if you're able to create a tool that allows certain things to be more useful or is become easily useful, you will see a wider adoption. And that will also see a wider research community developing around those ideas, which hasn't happened for these techniques around doping. Yeah. Yeah, you are right. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think so. You just mentioned the limitations and the, the future problems. So it's very, they are very, very inspiring. Yeah. Thank you. So, so, uh, can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Uh, again, uh, so the question that I have is uh, how is this, um, uh, how, what is the effect of the depth of the network? You know, how many layers and Right, so I haven't seen an effect on the depth of the network. I, I guess the language models that I explored had around 12 to 14 to 20 layers and then dope chronicler products still worked, right? So the, the, I personally didn't sort of find a correlation with uh, model accuracy with the depth, at least for the networks that I have sort of explored. So I think this is, the language model from Microsoft has around 12 to 20 layers. I forgot which one, but this is a significantly deeper network and a much larger network than these ones. And then still you are seeing good benefits in terms of compression and in comparison with previous state of the art. So uh, you would use the same approach for every layer or is that? Yes, 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 yes. It's a homogeneous approach. Each matrix in each layer is replaced by it's Kronecker product version plus a dense matrix that is eventually pulled off. I mean, you can get more, I would say, better by sort of adjusting the sparsity level per layer. I, I do same sparsity level for each layer by doing a non-homogeneous non sparsity across each layer. Maybe you can do better. And there is a reason to do that. Enough work has shown that different layers are susceptible to different amount of compressions. Right, some layers need more compression, some layers need, need less compression. But uh, again, we haven't looked into it. But I, I do believe you can do that to get more accuracy. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so if no more questions from the audience, so let's thank Amisha again so for your very inspiring and wonderful talk. And uh, thank you so much for giving us so many uh, useful informations. And uh, okay, so, okay. Also, so thank all the audience to attend our uh, Infusion AI seminar talk for this summer. So, so we will continue our seminar next Tuesday. And uh, thank you all. So. Have a great day. Yeah. And thank you for inviting me. And thank you for everyone for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.